Welcome to the Expat Chat, the show where we bring you inspirational interviews from expats, retirees, and global nomads who are living their dream life overseas cheaper, easier, and more carefree than their old life back home, bringing you your daily escape to paradise. Here's your host, Tony Argyle. Thanks, Nate, and hi, folks. Welcome to this, the very first episode of the Expat Chat Podcast. I'm Tony Argyle, and I've got to admit, I'm pretty excited to be bringing you the show. Over this and upcoming episodes, we're going to be talking to inspiring expats who have thrown away their high-pressure and often stressful old lifestyles to embark on a new adventure in foreign lands, living their dream lives for, in most cases, a fraction of the cost of their previous life back home. The people we will be interviewing have found genuine happiness in a new environment, sometimes travelling constantly, and in other cases settling in a new location and putting down roots. Their stories will differ from the Canadian couple now spending 70% of their year house-sitting multi-million dollar Caribbean homes, to the Kiwi couple living in Laos, who have established a cafe to train the locals in hospitality, where all the profits go directly to the local school. From our daily podcast, you'll get to meet people living on every continent, from Argentina to Australia, from Vietnam to Venezuela, and everywhere in between. I'll introduce today's guest shortly, but before I do, I just want to give a quick shout out to our Facebook fans who have liked and shared our page. A big thank you to Howard Marsh, Kwabini Perry, I hope I've pronounced that right, Celeste Weaver, and One Happy Hippie, whoever you might be. All of you, thanks for sharing. If you'd like us to give you a shout out on the show, just visit our Facebook page at the Expat Chat and give us a like. Share it with your friends and we'll give you a shout out. Thanks so much. So on to today's guest. Not many people will be prepared to walk away from a well-paying career job in the prime of their earnings life, but somebody who was is David Dean. The New Zealander left his corporate position in Australia in 2011 to embark on a road trip that looks like lasting for the rest of his life. It may sound to many like a rush of blood to the head, but Dave had carefully planned his exit from the rat race for a period of time and had developed a secondary income stream that he knew could sustain him in his original destination of choice, Thailand. Since then, Dave's online business has grown to the extent that he can now travel the world and sustain his lifestyle on a monthly basis. But we're not talking about big dollars here. Thanks to his blog and his travel technology website, Dave is able to live his idyllic lifestyle, most months for less than 2,500 US, proving that paradise doesn't have to cost you a fortune. If you're wondering how you can make full-time travel affordable and how this experience can change your life, then let me introduce you to David Dean. Well, we're here with Dave Dean. Dave, pleasure having you on the show today. Welcome. Good to be here. Now, tell us, whereabouts in the world are you and uh, and what exactly is your surroundings at the moment? Well, I'm currently in Porto, which is uh, a town in or a city in northern Portugal. Um, as the name suggests, it's where port comes from. Uh, so I'm developing a, uh, a newfound love of port. While I'm here, um, and yeah, I'm I'm in a, uh, an Airbnb apartment in probably about or oh, a ten minute walk downhill to the city centre, uh, and I'll be here at the stage for two or three weeks. Sounds ideal. So now you've you've been doing this for a period of time, haven't you? I have. Uh, I quit my final corporate job um, a little over three and a half years ago now. And I've been on the road ever since. So what prompted you to do this? I mean, obviously, you, you had a good job. It was a big decision, I would have thought, to, to decide to do this. It was not it wasn't. Uh, taking the final leap was certainly um, a challenge in some ways, but it felt like a decision I'd been leading up to for a long time. Um, the reality for me is I, I had had a series of what people would probably call good jobs, um, I fell into an IT career, uh, having planned to be a journalist. Not quite sure how that works, but that's how it worked. Um, and so I worked, you know, I worked in, in London and Sydney and Melbourne and Christchurch and all over the place. And I was earning good money and I had, you know, good, a good job and good career. Uh, but it wasn't really satisfying me. It never really had except, for, you know, other than financially. Um, and it was becoming less satisfying over time. And so I, and every time I traveled, I, you know, I felt this amazing sense of, of freedom. And so at, at various points, I quit, you know, I quit a job and I'd throw everything into a backpack and I'd hit the road for a few months and be like, oh, this is wonderful. And then I'd run out of money and I'd have to go back home again. Um, and, you know, I decided, well, I, I realized after a while, um, that there had to be a way to not have to come back home again, uh, and to, to make money. 
from the road and I started meeting people who were doing it. You know, when I first started traveling in the late nineties, there, there was no way of doing that really, other than you know, like you know, guidebook writers and stuff like that. But um, as time went by and the internet came along and laptops came along and you know, online life came along, um, you know, I started meeting a few people who were doing it, and eventually I thought, well, you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. Um, and I started you know, blogs and websites and doing different things, and I set myself a in the end, I set myself a goal. Um, I, I had a contract in Melbourne. My contract was due to run out in November of that year. And I said, if I'm making a thousand bucks a month from online income, um, I'm going, I'm not going to renew this contract. I'm going to move to Thailand and, and do this full time. And the reason why it was a thousand bucks is I knew I could live a, a comfortable life in Thailand on a thousand dollars a month. Um, and a couple of months before my contract expired, I hit the magic number and I was like, whoops, guess I'm going. <laughs> um, so told my boss I wasn't renewing the contract, gave him notice in my apartment, um, signed my stuff and left. So it doesn't sound like there was a defining moment of frustration for you. You just, you've been planning this for quite some while. Obviously. Yeah, there wasn't a defining, there wasn't a defining moment of frustration. It was, it was a slow burn over an, a, a number of years and the realization that if I continued down that path, I would be financially rich and emotionally poor for a, long, for a large part of my life, and that wasn't what I was looking for. It's interesting you, you comment there, you know, knowing that $1,000 a month would survive in Thailand. I think a lot of people probably don't appreciate how easy it is to live well in a lot of these countries. Yeah, it, it's extremely easy. Um, Southeast Asia especially is uh, remarkably cheap for a very high quality of life. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like I was I was you know living in a shack and and eating rice and nothing else for you know my, for my life. This was a you know an air conditioned studio apartment with fast internet, um, eating whatever I wanted, you know, uh, renting a scooter to to drive myself around everywhere I went, um, you know, a gym membership, uh, all the rest of it. You know, I was living uh, probably in almost almost a higher quality of life than I had in Melbourne for an, an awful lot less money. So, in terms of of your travels, then Thailand was your original destination. Did you plan to stay there? Was that the original goal, or um, I, I stayed there for I planned to stay there for a while, and I did stay there for a while. Uh, visas are a little bit of an issue in almost all of Southeast Asia, possibly except Cambodia. Um, it's easy to stay for a few months. It's much harder to stay for longer than that um, in terms of legal visa options. So. Uh, at that point, and things change all the time, especially in Thailand with visas, but at that point, it wasn't that hard to get a visa that allowed you to be there for, for six months. You had, to, you had to leave occasionally and come back, but basically to be there for six months. Uh, so that's what I got before I left. I stayed there for almost six months, uh, and then I moved on. Um, and I've been moving. I've mean, gone back again a few times, but basically I've been moving every few months or every few days or every few weeks um, ever since. What surprised me when I spoke to you last week about the interview, your, your response by email was, yeah, next week I'll be fine. I'll either be in the Baltic or Portugal, <laughs> which <laughs> doesn't sound as though you plan ahead a long way. I mean, how do you get on with travel costs with that? Obviously, you do a lot of last-minute bookings. Does that make it more expensive? Um, the great thing about – the answer is yes, sort of. Um, it makes it more expensive sometimes, but when you are – very flexible about where you go and exactly when you go there, um, those costs drop back down again. So the reason why it was the Baltics or Portugal, it was going to be the Baltics. And then flight prices went up. And I was like, ah, well, you know, I can afford it, but they're at a point where they're now high enough where I'm going to look elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I ended up in Portugal because the flight prices were a bit cheaper and the cost of living was you know, similar and I'd never been here, and I was like, oh, well, it doesn't really make much difference to me right now whether I'm in Porto or, or the Baltics for the next three weeks. Um, so I'll go to Porto. Did you develop this attitude over time of being fairly laid back about it? I mean, it's not your normal corporate environment where everything's planned in advance. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I certainly developed this over time. Um, I was as, as stressed and worked up and anxious about everything as, as anybody else uh, when I first started. Um, you know, I, I wrote a blog post years ago probably talking about, you know, to the extent to which I planned my first trip. And I, when I first went to London and Europe in like 1998, 
uh, you know, I had pages and pages of notes and ideas about where I should go and what I should do and like bookmarks and my lonely planet and all the rest of it. You know, now, well, I mean, you know, it, it's not unusual for me to not know where I'm going to be a week from now and, and not to know what I'm going to do when I get there either. That's going to be pretty refreshing, I'd say. What, yeah, what? it is. It's, it's, it's funny actually that, um, cause it, it, it's shut, even though I hadn't, I wasn't doing it full time, but it started to spill over into my corporate jobs a little bit towards the end in terms of, uh, not a devil may care attitude, but just a refusal to get worked up by little things that didn't matter. Uh, which certainly other people found a little interesting. Would you term yourself unemployable now? Um, uh, probably. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I actually had this conversation with somebody the other, the other day. I mean, I don't think I'd be completely unemployable, although whether anybody would give me a job given how long I've been out of the IT game, the corporate IT game is another question, but say somebody was silly enough to do it. Um, I think a part-time job I could probably do, uh, you know, two or three days a week where I could come in and do the work, not get too caught up in all the politics and stuff that goes with it, and then walk out the door again. I could do that, but a full-time corporate gig again, yeah, it'd be a challenge. <laughs> So obviously before you made this decision, I mean, you'd done a bit of travel, but you must have had some fears or concerns before you left. What, what were the issues that you, you well, were worrying you before you went, and have they come to fruition? Um, I guess the, the, the fears I had were not around the travel, because I knew how to do that. You know, travel itself, even at that point, didn't hold that many fears, and now it doesn't really hold any. Um, it was more around the financials, you know, was I, I mean, yes, sure, I was making enough money to live in Thailand, but I wasn't going to be able to be in Thailand forever. Um, you know, other parts of the world are more expensive. And was I going to be able to ramp up my income to cover my, well, to me, it's more than cover my costs. I mean, you know, there, there's sort of two ways, there, there was two things I was trying to do. One was to at least cover my costs on an ongoing basis. Uh, and the other was to actually start replacing some of my corporate income. Um, the, fir the first has certainly happened. The second is still a work in progress. That's an interesting point there because obviously going to Thailand, you're talking about you know a thousand dollars a month, which is not too demanding to work with. But the travel you've been doing and the countries you've been living in haven't been that cheap. I mean, how are you finding that juggling with the, the actual growing of, of an income stream that will sustain what you're doing? Um, I mean, basically the way I look at my expenses are average costs over the course of a year. Um, because they can vary so much uh, on a week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis. Um, so on average, over the course of a year, every year, uh, I've been able to cover my costs and a bit more, but only a little bit more. Um, the way in which I've done that change, has changed significantly um, as the online world changes and, uh, and as some things become more profitable and other things become less, but... Um, the actual amount of money we're talking about, it, it, it's moving slowly upwards, but it's a, it's a slow graph. It's not, it's not fast growth by any stretch. Okay. So I don't want to put you in an awkward position here, obviously, and, and your costs do vary, but to do what you're doing on average, what, what does it cost per month? Uh, I would say that on average, across the course of a year, I probably spend, Two to two and a half, uh, probably two thousand dollars a month. Um, yeah, well, say between two and two and a half, depending on the year. But uh, including your airfare, and that, that, yeah, that, that's 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 everything. Wow. Um, and the reason why it's you know that may seem quite cheap. The airfares, although they are a substantial chunk of money, the way I travel usually seems tends to be I'll go to I'll base myself in a region for a while. So, you know, there'll be one more expensive flight to get from, as an example, Asia to Europe. Um, and then I'll stay in Europe for several months. Yep. So any flights are just, you know, little, you know, little jumps across the continent, which only cost, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever. Um, and so as a result, and, and the other thing is I stay, especially as time's gone by, I'm traveling more and more slowly. And so that means I can rent apartments by the month for example rather than paying day rates right. um and that you know, and that so that brings the cost down substantially so um in terms of the, your travel you've done now you've you've 
how many countries have you been to? And if you were to pick one to, to settle down in, which, which country would it be? Um, I don't count countries, so I don't actually know exactly. Um, but I would guess around 50, maybe. I'm, I'm not really quite sure. Um, in terms of where I would choose to base myself, I mean, if, if visas were no issue, and that's, you know, I have to say, I have to start every conversation like this with that disclaimer because it's not always possible to do it. Yeah. Um, but if visas were no issue, um, I'd probably narrow it down to two or three places. One would be Spain, which I'm actually looking at, uh, I'm actually going to Spain in a couple of weeks and with, and sort of looking at the idea of a longer term base there. Um, Taiwan is another one. Um, yeah, I mean, the, those are the two that are front of mind right now that are actually affordable uh, to me. Um, but, you know, if, if, if income went through the roof, then uh, then it would be a different story. But um, I, I'm fortunate enough that I have a UK passport as well as my New Zealand one, so staying in Europe is not a, is not a problem for me. That makes it, um, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, in Spain, and also Portugal, as I'm discovering, um, have a pretty low cost of living and a pretty high quality of life. Um, so, interesting what you say there about Taiwan. I just read your blog coming through this morning. In fact, I've posted it up on our Facebook page on the Expat Chat. Um, that was your first time to Taiwan, and your girlfriend was a big fan of it, wasn't she? She persuaded you to go. Very much so. So she um, she went, well, yeah, I mean, a, a long time ago, before she met me. So uh, four, three and a half years ago, four years ago almost. Um, and she actually she loved it and to be honest she couldn't shut up about it um <laughs> and uh you know it just hadn't flights had never quite worked out or our, our, our plans had never quite worked out um and then yeah we were we were we were going to um to burma to to Myanmar, and we needed to figure out where we were going after that and we had to book a little bit in advance because the internet's so terrible there that you basically can't do anything like that when you're in the country um, and so we saw a cheap flight to Taipei and she's like, let's go, let's go. And it's like, okay, we're going. Um, and we went and it was just as amazing as she'd said. And I had no idea why I hadn't gone before then. Um, and so yeah, that, that moved it right up my, my list of places like I could live in the future. I just want to come back to what you're talking about costings. You know, you, this is not expensive what you're doing. And you've still seen, even working in hubs of Europe and, and Asia, you've still seen most of the continents, haven't you? You've done a little bit of South America and North America? And uh, didn't quite get to South America. I, got as, we, I planned to uh, last year, and then my girlfriend actually got a book deal, uh, which required sitting in one place in front of a laptop for a long period of time. Um, and we were traveling through Central America at that point, and we kind of had to pull the pin and go somewhere where we could just sit uh, for a while. Um, so we went back to Southeast Asia. So I, I, I didn't quite get to South America, haven't been there or Antarctica, uh, but I've been to the other five continents. Okay. So the other, the, the two remaining ones are uh, very much on the list, and uh, we'll, we'll get uh, we'll get visited before long. You guys have an interesting relationship, don't you? Because you you met on the road, and you have moments where you travel together, but you also go and do your own thing. Is that right? It is. Um, so we met we met she met in Thailand. Uh, we met eight days after I uh, after I started this this adventure. Uh, we met. I had absolutely no interest or desire to look for a, a girlfriend or to have a relationship at that point. I was uh, very focused on I want to work on my business and I want to you know, to make money and all the rest of it. And of course, that's exactly when you do meet somebody. So um, Murphy's law. Yeah, Murphy's law. So uh, we've been together traveling for the better part of four years now. Um, so yeah, we 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 spend most of our time together. I would say. And, you know, although ironically she's not with me at the moment, um, but uh, I would say we probably spend on average about two, maybe two months of the year apart, and ten months together. Um, but obviously, when we're together, because she she also works online, uh, you know, it's twenty four hours a day. So it's it, it's it's a very interesting way to have a relationship with anybody. I'd say most um, people would say it's so ideal. I think everyone would love to send their partner away for a couple of months a year and have a bit of a break. Yeah, well, well, I mean, it, you know, and, and you know, there's not a reflection on her or anybody else, but it, it actually becomes an, a, a requirement because, like I say, when you when you when every minute from when you wake up in the morning to when you go to bed, you, know, you are with someone. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how much you love them or how wonderful they are, you can't 
you can't do that you know, every single day of your life. Well, especially doing what you're doing. I mean, it's not the amazing race in terms of high speed, but you're doing a slowed down version. There's decisions to be made. There's potential for arguments and disagreements. So it's probably a very healthy yeah. situation, I would think. Oh, it, it, yeah, it is. Um, and, you know, obviously we've, we've worked out a system that works well for us uh, on, on travel day. Is, uh, when, you know, when we're traveling, especially, basically, you know, Lauren does all the research uh, and I do all the logistics for actually getting us there uh, on the day. And that works pretty well. But, you know, I, I won't lie. We still, we still have arguments. Things get stressful, you know. Yeah. Um, but we're both pretty, we're about, you know, we're about as laid back as we can be while still actually getting anywhere yeah. uh, when it comes to travel days because we, you know, we, we, we learn how to do it now. Okay. So how do you deal with healthcare? Because obviously being on the move all the time and, and you know, you, you just mentioned to me before you're coming up to 40, so you're still reasonably young. Health probably isn't a big issue, but is that a concern in the back of your mind and how do you deal with it traveling from country to country? Um, I have travel insurance uh, that, that, you know, uh, I, I buy it annually um, and that covers, uh, well, in fact, it, would, it would cover almost anything. Um, it's just whether it's worth claiming based on how much it costs because there is an excess that goes with it. Um, in terms of things like dental care, uh, I usually get that done when I'm in Thailand or somewhere in Southeast Asia. You can get very high quality uh, US trained often, uh, dentists and doctors there. Um, and you just pay out of pocket for that and it costs almost nothing. Mm. Um, you know, it, there, there's no, you don't need to claim for insurance or anything like that. You just make an appointment and go. Um, things like uh, medications, or again, in Asia, almost all medications can be bought over the counter. You don't need a doctor's prescription for them necessarily. Um, but yeah, so in terms of emergency care, uh, health insurance, in terms of, you know, checkups and just general day to day illnesses, um, I just, I, I pay out of pocket. Um, here in Europe, uh, there is a, a European wide, um, health, health insurance system essentially. And because I once worked in the UK many years ago, um, and I had a national insurance number, I could actually get that card. So if I need to go and visit a doctor or go to a hospital here, uh, I won't pay for that because I have this uh, I have this this card with me, but that's yeah, that's just a pure fluke of the fact that I happened to work here 15 years ago. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about Asian health because it's become more and more obvious to me lately, and and this is probably an area of concern for some people as they don't think necessarily the healthcare is that good. But from what I've been reading and understanding and and hearing from other people, countries like Thailand and Malaysia, uh, the healthcare is actually better than you find in most of the Western world for a fraction of the cost. Is is that the case? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, you need to pick your spot. If you, if, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you walk into the one health clinic in the little town in Cambodia, you're not going to get great healthcare. Yeah. Um, if you go to, you know, a major city, so Bangkok or Chiang Mai or Kuala Lumpur or Saigon or anywhere like that, um, I mean, they, there are private, uh, clinics, private hospitals and private dental clinics that are specifically aimed at you know, the, the richer members of local society and expats, um, and tourists, I guess. Um, but the amount, so the, 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 this, these look, they're, they're nicer than any hospital I've ever been to, uh, or any dental clinic I've ever been to in, in uh, Australia or New Zealand. Uh, they're staffed by, you know, people who speak very good English, you, often trained, uh, in you know, Europe or, or the US. Um, and you will pay a fraction of what you will pay uh, back home, you know, for, both for medications and consultations. Mm. And and the quality of the care is very good. I mean, you know, there, like I say, I get all my dental you know, checkups and everything done there. Uh, I would have actually no qualms about having you know, dental work, you know, like fillings and anything else that needed doing, having that done there. Um, a lot of people I know, um, they almost, you know, they, they save up their, their, their medical needs, you know, if they want to get any tests done or if they want to get, anything non-urgent looked at, you know, they'll wait till they're in Asia to do it because the care's so good and the costs are so low. Yeah. Is, is um, safety been an issue with your travels? I mean, I guess that's something that concerns a lot of people. Have you had any incidents happen that cause you concern? No. Um, short answer. Uh, I've never been mugged. I've never been robbed. Uh, I've never been attacked in any way. Um, I mean, occasionally, you know, so you walk down a, a darker street at night and there's a couple of guys who give you a funny look. But, I mean, honestly, I feel safer 
almost anywhere I go than I would feel wandering around downtown Melbourne on a Friday night. I was going to say, Dave, I can get funny looks walking around the Gold Coast. <laughs> That's not an yeah. overseas problem. No, no, exactly. I mean, and, and actually, you know, to be honest, the, the Gold Coast, uh, you know, like on a Friday or Saturday night, would, would, I'd be way more concerned about being attacked there um, than, than, I, than I am. And you know, especially, I mean, Southeast Asia especially, because it's a simple, the simple fact is, you're, you know, as a guy, you're probably bigger than most of the guys there, yeah. um, which sort of helps, you know, the, 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 I mean, it doesn't, you know, someone's got a knife and they want to attack you, they're going to attack you, but you know, this has never happened to me. I think just, you know, basic things, you know, don't, don't wear expensive clothes, expensive jewelry, don't flash your iPhone or whatever around, um, you know, you, you just, common I sense. call it common sense, yeah. but a lot of people don't seem to have it, but, um, you know, just, just, be mindful of what you're doing and, and, and how you are portraying yourself to other people. Um, touch wood, I've never, I've never had a problem and, and, and my girlfriend hasn't either. You know, she, she's had all, you know, she, she's, she's an unlucky traveler. I mean, that, and that's the basis of her, of her upcoming book, but she's never had a serious, um, yeah, she's never been attacked or, or robbed or anything like that. Um, yeah, and she, and she was traveling, she, she travels solo now. She was traveling solo for several months before she met me in, in all, all kinds of places around the world. Um, so yeah, you know, the world, with a bit of common sense, the world is not a dangerous place. I guess sometimes it can come down to misunderstanding, which I, you know, could be a language thing. And obviously you're traveling a lot, so you don't get the opportunity to learn local languages. Have you, have you found language barriers to be a problem? Um, language barriers are an ongoing, you know, feature or factor in my life. Um, but most people are, are good and most people want to help you out. Um, and that's not just people who have a vested interest in doing so, you know, like hoteliers or restaurant owners or taxi drivers or whatever. But I mean, yeah, I, don't, I, I spoke no Spanish at all when I first went to Mexico and, and, and very little even when I got to Granada earlier this year. You know, my Spanish is horrible. And what I have, I've picked up you know, just bits and pieces from having to use it. And people were incredibly patient with my you know, disgusting Spanish. Um, you know, my Portuguese is even worse, and that hasn't been a problem. Um, I think in people Asia, appreciate that you at least try, don't they? I mean, that's, that's people, really people appreciate that, that you try. Um, and if they if they speak reasonable English, they'll often switch to it. Although I was in, I was impressed uh, in in Spain. You know, people in Mexico, people would let me flounder along. For a long time, when it would be much easier for them to move to English, because uh, um, you know they'll get the job done a lot faster. But they they could see I was really attempting to 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 speak or mangle their language, and they, and they let me do it for until we until I ran out of words, you, which did not take that long. To you're probably a source of entertainment. <laughs> oh, I, I, look, absolutely. Uh, I, I was amusing myself, if not anybody else. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, and, and in Asia, because people don't really expect you're going to be fluent in Vietnamese or Thai or or uh, you know, anything like that. So um, if you've got a few words, that's great. But in general, people will have more English than you have of, of their language. And we're very and spoiled you know, that too. As, as we're, we're very spoiled. Yeah. We're extremely spoiled. I mean, you know, I, I thank my lucky stars in many ways. That, that you know, There's many aspects of my life that have got me to where I am. And being born an English speaker is absolutely one of them. Yes. So I guess with your travels, I mean, there'll be some sacrifices you have to make. What is it you've had to do without that you really miss being on the road with? Um, in terms of physical things, nothing. Um, I mean, you know, even silly things like you know veggie mart or whatever. I'm uh, I'm I'm back in Australia here in New Zealand often enough. I can get my fix of that. Um, so in terms of physical things, no. If, if I if I want something, you know. Uh, well, I, I, my expectations, uh, or my requirements are so severely diminished over having a normal, you know, a normal life. Um, I don't need a car, I don't need a fancy house or any of the stuff to put in it. Uh, yeah, if it doesn't fit in my backpack, I don't own it. Um, so yeah, physical stuff, no. Um, the thing I do, I do without, uh, that I would rather not do without is being around friends and family. Um, that is the, you know, unfortunate reality for me. Um, now, you know, my family is somewhat dispersed. There's some in New Zealand, there's some in Australia. Currently, there's my one brother in Amsterdam, another one in the UK. Um, so it's not like I can move to one place and be around them all anyway. But that doesn't mean I don't miss having them around. So, um, 
yeah, the, you know, regular contact or not contact. I'm, I'm in contact with them all the time, but you know, being able to sit down and, and physically be with them, uh, that's something I, I I have to do without, and I, I prefer not to. But it's uh, the unfortunate sacrifice that comes with this life. I guess the internet helps these days. I mean, things are improving in that regard. But how do you find with travel, and particularly with your business, the internet's obviously a very important connection for you. Do you have many issues with it as you're traveling around? Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely. But, you know, it's it's manageable most of the time. Um, so I I run a, as well as my travel site, I run a, a travel technology site. Um, and so I... A, you know, for example, I buy a, a local SIM card in almost every country I go to, even if I don't necessarily really need it, but I, I, I do it to write about it. So I always have some form of connection, um, on my phone, if nothing else. Um, in terms of Wi-Fi, you know, there's been, you know, hundreds of occasions where I've been trying to do something somewhere in the world and the Wi-Fi is too slow or it cuts out or it just dies completely. Um, you know, and it's frustrating, but it's also reality. It just, you, it just means you have to work around it. You have to go and find a, a cafe or, or you know, somewhere else to work, or you have to, you know, just accept that the Skype call you were going to have, you're not going to have today or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so you need to give yourself, well, I need to give myself more, more time, um, when it comes to things like deadlines. Um, Especially if I'm moving around, you know, it's so like here I am now. My internet in this apartment is incredibly fast, uh, way faster than it would be back in you know, Australia or New Zealand. Mm. Um, and I, because I'm here for two or three weeks, I know that's how it's going to be. So I can make plans. So I can have, I can have Skype calls. I can do the work. I can say I'm going to deliver something on time because I know the internet's going to work. And a lot of what you do probably isn't deadline based either. And actually, just leading into that, do you, do you want to tell us a bit more about what you do do? Because you've got a website that basically advises travellers on technology. Really, is that right? That's right. So I, I I started off with my travel blog, uh, what's Dave doing, and that was you know, I started that, oh geez, um, about five and a half years ago, um, and that was what I was making initially. I was making all of my money uh, through advertising. Advertising and, and whatever. Um, and then when I got to Thailand, I co-founded a travel technology site called Too Many Adapters. I was trying to combine my corporate life, my IT knowledge and whatever with my travel, uh, my travel life. Um, and that was the end result. And I spend more of my time on that now. Um, primarily because it's got a, greater upside there's more money to be made um and also it's branched out it's given me lots of freelance writing opportunities because there's nobody else really writing about this stuff um or you know or not with any real degree of, of experience and so i get approached quite often by people who want me to, to write pieces either one-offs or ongoing uh, on something to do with travel technology so i have a whole bunch of, sort of irons in the fire if you like um all of which contribute something towards my monthly income and you know, the exact ratios move around over time but um, basically between all the things I do you know it, it makes enough money to fund it so so if people want to know more about that side of it what's your website's name again Dave? Uh, so what's Dave doing dot com is the travel blog and too many adapters dot com is the travel technology site so basically that's focusing around apps, um, devices like that. And I guess that's a constantly changing area too. There'd be a lot of information in there you'd have to keep up with. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, you know, it covers apps. It covers a lot of how-to, um, you know, backups and security and encryption and uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, hardware, you know, device recommendations, which phone should you buy, which laptop should you buy, which you know, whatever should you buy. Um and yeah, I mean, yeah, take take a look at the site. There's probably I don't know 400 articles or 500 articles on there by now uh, that cover all kinds of things. So if you're interested in technology and travel, that's that's a good place to start. Well, anything that makes a trip easier, and uh, I think technology certainly would help in that area. So it, it, it does. I mean, you, know, you you can get too caught up on it for sure, but uh, a, a little bit of the right technology goes a long way when it comes to reducing the stress of uh, of travel. <laughs> Would you um, would you consider moving home again at some point? I mean, you don't sound as though you're keen to uh, to get off the road and return to the rat race anytime soon. What, what's your plans from here? <laughs> it's not it's not high on my agenda 
<laughs> there, I must admit. Who um, can blame you? I mean, it, well, I mean, the first, the first question really is where is home. Um, I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. You know, in some ways it's New Zealand um, because it's where I was born and where I grew up. But in some ways it's Australia because it's, you know, I spent several years there. You know, in some ways it's, it could be the UK because I lived there for a while and I have a British passport. You know, um, and my girlfriend's British. You know, the, the home could be a, a number of places, but. Um, you know, there's, there's two, it's an interesting question, or it's a multi-layered question in some ways. Um, because when you say return to the rat race, I have less than no desire to do any part of that. Um, but I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean I wouldn't, uh, live somewhere for an extended period of time or, or, or have a base there. Right. Um, so I'm not interested in, you know, buying a big house and having a fancy car. Uh, I'm not interested in the corporate, uh, you know, living a corporate life. But, you know, could I have, could I rent or even buy an apartment somewhere like Spain and base myself there for six to nine months of the year? Yeah, sure. I could do that. It's really just a um, continuation of what you're doing now, but in one place. Yeah, you, you, it's basically, it's basically just slow, it's, it's slowing down the travels even more. Um, and, you know, giving myself back a little, um, a little bit in terms of sort of stability, you know, being able to own a little bit more than what fits in my backpack, um, you, know, you know, being able to have more than one pair of jeans and two pairs of shoes. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. But I, in terms of signing up to, to, to do, you know the so-called traditional uh, life. Yeah, I, I I I had to go up there. It didn't really work for me, so I'm trying something else now. Yeah, and it seems to be working out pretty well. Yeah. David, it, final it does. question: How would you how would you describe how what you're doing has changed your life? Uh, it's it's changed it completely. Uh, I mean, you know, I well, I I, I now have a, a girlfriend who loves to do what I do as much as as much as I do. Um, I have almost complete freedom to, to be where I want, when I want, um, and to move locations, uh, if, if things aren't working for me, or even if the weather gets bad and I want to go somewhere else. Um, most importantly though, it's just having the control of my life. So, you know, from, from a business point of view, you know, if I don't want to do a certain type of work, I won't do that anymore. If I don't like someone who I'm working for, I'll fire that client. If I want to have a go at doing something else because I think there's some money in it, I just start doing it. Um, so although my, you know, I don't earn anywhere near as much money as I did in my corporate job, the, what I do satisfies me so much more. And it's just a very, um, a very good feeling to know now that, you know, I, I can't lose my job. I can't get made redundant from my job mm. because it's my job. It's me. And sure, I can stop making money in one particular area, but I've got three or four others that will keep me going while I find a replacement for that. Um, so I feel you know, it, it, it's, it's weird given how, you know, in some ways, how little money I make compared to I used to, how secure I feel uh, financially. Has it changed you as a person as well? Uh, yeah. I, it, it, it's, it's changed. Well, it, it's continued a change, it's accelerated the change that was slowly happening. Um, you know, I feel, in general, I feel very relaxed. I feel very happy. Um, you know, I, I'm i doing what I'd always wanted to do. Uh, and this is satisfaction that comes from having a long-held dream that you never really necessarily knew you were going to get to achieve and then achieving it. Uh, it's a pretty great feeling. Yeah. Dave, you are an inspirational expat. There's no doubt about it. Thank you very much for your time today. Just before we um, we finish up, just give everyone a re recap again as to how they can get hold of you and your websites. Uh, if you go to whatsdavedoing.com, um, you know, read around on there. There's a, a contact page if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, too many adapters.com if you're interested in travel technology. Uh, there's a, a book that I wrote on there if you want to, uh, if you're interested in doing this yourself and you're wondering about the, the technical parts of moving, you know, uh, working from the road, then there's a, a book you can buy to do that. Um, and I'm also on social media, so if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any of those sorts of things, you'll be able to find me there as well. 
Brilliant. Dave, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I've, I've been looking forward to this for some time, having followed you for the last couple of years, so I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Danny. Well, that was Dave Dean, guys, and I hope you really enjoy the interview with him as much as I did. There's a few things I took away from Dave's interview today. Firstly, he had a clear plan. There was no swear at the boss and walkout moment for Dave. He did his homework, knew his target for income he needed, which was shockingly low at only $1,000 per month, and he worked towards a date, and it all worked out for him in that regard. Secondly, living an expat life is incredibly affordable, even allowing for moving around. Dave works the hubs of Europe and Asia getting cheap flights and deals within regions which allows him to keep expensive long-haul flights to a minimum. He also uses online sites like Airbnb to secure apartments. An orphan of you he actually shared with me that negotiating monthly rates for Asian hotels can have you getting some fantastic deals from as little as $500 per month. Thirdly, healthcare is not an issue, it's actually a benefit. Many larger Asian cities have Western trained doctors and high quality clinics at extremely affordable prices that make Western hospitals and surgeries look very ordinary. In many cases you can walk in off the street and be treated in these clinics in a matter of minutes for less than $50. Dave gets his dental work done when he's in Asia and has no regrets about using the services. So that's the end of our first interview on the expat chat. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Next show we're going to be talking to Michael and Yvonne Bausch who spend most of the year jet-setting around the Caribbean house-sitting. I'm sure you're going to enjoy the interview. Until then, I'm Tony Argyle. I hope you've enjoyed your little escape to paradise today. We'll talk to you again soon.